know there's a lot of people out there today who share my frustration with the cumulative events that are happening in the world and this sense that there's nothing we can do about them. But there's also this sense of desperate urgency is if we don't do anything about them, we're going to be creating a lot of problems for the future generations. We've got globalization that has totally failed to spread the wealth evenly amongst us, and as a result of our rapid and perpetual economic growth, we have climate change and dozens of other social and ecological problems. Our food system is very insecure, and it's totally centralized. And what I mean by this is that it's entirely dependent on cheap and abundant oil, and it's controlled by a very limited number of corporations. All the way from the processing, the distribution, everything in between. Everyone can see that the days of cheap and abundant oil are nearing an end, and this has been happening for quite some time. So we've seen food prices go up 4% this year, and it's a trend that's going to continue. Most of our food that we get through the conventional system has been shipped thousands of miles from where it was produced to where it's consumed. So this means if there's any disruption in the supply chain from point A to point B, that people can be starving right away. And it really only takes a couple days for grocery store shelves to be emptied. Almost every action we take in our day-to-day -day lives right now is detrimental to the environment. Whether it's driving our car to and from work or the products that we consume on a day-to-day -day basis, technology, and then we throw away. Perpetual economic growth is perpetual ecological destruction. It's really that simple. But how can this happen forever? We live on a finite planet with finite resources, topsoil, natural habitat, clean air, and fresh water. We see economic inequality everywhere now, and the gap between the rich and the poor has become so extreme that it's no surprise that the Occupy Wall Street movement and the Arab Spring have spread to every corner of the globe. Even though you might not hear this in the media every day, it's happening. So we've totally lost connection to the land and each other. Most people nowadays can identify hundreds of corporate logos, but would struggle to tell you what the difference between a beet or a turnip is. We sit in little boxes day in and day out, whether it's the cars we drive, the cubicles we work in, or the walled communities that we build around us. We have, <laughs> um, we measure our success by the things that we own and not who we are as people or what we've done to make the world a better place. So these are the things that drove me to the brink of losing my mind about four years ago and made me take a complete 180 turn from my life as a struggling musician slash forestry worker to the farmer that stands before you today. And back then, and still today, all I want to do is live by my values. I want to have the actions that I take in my day-to-day -day life be life-affirming and not destructive. Because in nature, every single thing, every single process that occurs through the cycle of life creates more life as a result. Whereas in globalization and in our economic system, everything is destructive. So it's really like we're missing the big picture here. And so this was my challenge before I got into farming. How do I walk the talk and how do I make a living at it? Because I don't want to drive a car around and be polluting all the time just to do the things that I need to do to survive, for, to have for basic sustenance. And at the same time, I don't want to be a weekend warrior either. I don't want to talk about my values and then immediately check them out the door every time I go to work. So long before I got into farming, I have always had this interest in sustainability, and I guess what I really felt was, in order for me to live by my values, I had to control what I was eating, because food is connected to so many of the things and the problems that we see today. So I really romanticized that. Oh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get a piece of land, I'm gonna live off the land, and I guess I romanticized that so much because I really had no idea what that looked like because I'd never had experience growing food. I didn't have a, a garden as a kid and I didn't know anything about farming. So how does a person get land if they can't afford it? Because for me, I didn't come from a wealthy background and in order to buy land, you need to have quite a bit of money. And I wasn't ready to sign on to a 30-year mortgage and just sign my life away, and work for the bank for 30 years. To me, that was totally working against what my principles were, and that I wanted to be in control of the actions that I took in my day-to-day -day life so that I could truly live by my values. And these are the, th the challenges that farmers face today, particularly young farmers. And it's part of the reason why 
we don't see a lot of new farmers coming onto the scene because those main barriers to entry are the land and the capital. So if you can't buy the land, how are you going to get into farming? And if you don't have the capital involved to set up the infrastructure of what we know as conventional money-making farming, how are you going to do this? And so if you can identify with what I'm saying, that maybe this was something you were, you're, you're calling to do, and you're running into these same barriers, what if I told you that there was a way you could live off the land, you could farm commercially, you could be a direct solution to food insecurity, economic inequality, and environmental degradation. You could build community ties and social capital, and you could make a living at it. It almost sounds too good to be true, and it's what a friend of mine told me about four years ago when I was in this frustrated situation where I didn't know how I was going to do this because all I wanted to do was live by my values, and it was so challenging. It's just like, God, how do I do this? But he told me about this thing called spin farming. And spin farming means small plot intensive, and it's essentially a methodology on how to farm commercially on small plots of land, multiple plots of land, that you don't own. And there was guys out there making $50,000 on half an acre or less of land. And when he told me this, I said, that sounds crazy, because I'd spent some time reading some books on, on organic agriculture. I thought I knew what I was talking about, but I really didn't. And I looked into it, and I found that there was guys doing this. They were farming in backyards, and I was totally stoked. It's like, wow, this is crazy. And they were doing it in Canada. The, the, create, the co founder of Spin Farming is in Saskatoon, which is a shadow of a growing climate to what we have here in Kelowna. And he's farming on multiple yards and making a great living at it. And then I discovered a guy in Nelson, BC, who's doing this. Again, a shadow of a growing climate that we have here. And he was doing it by his bike. And if anybody's been to Nelson before and you've seen the hills there, it's crazy. So I thought, holy, this guy is hardcore. That's it. That's what I'm doing. So I invested $7,000 of my own money. And I, I basically, I didn't have a lot, but I put it all in. I said, all cards on the table. I'm just going to go for this because even if it fails, I don't care. At least I tried. And it, it's not like I would have been out on the street. So I went for it and I started uh, Green City Acres as, um, as it is today. And so this will, oh, our slides, we're having some difficulty with our slides here. Okay, here we go. So we farm on three quarters of an acre, and it's divided amongst eight different plots throughout the city. A lot of them look like this. They're just front and back yards. On so as far as their side go size goes, they're about 500 to 2,000 square feet. And we're essentially just turning in lawn and turning it into a garden. The great thing about farming in the city is that we have something called the heat island effect, where we're surrounded by thermal mass. We have concrete roads, buildings, all kinds of physical obstructions. So we're a little bit sheltered from extreme weather events, but we have this heat sink where during the day, the sun absorbs into that thermal mass around us, and then at nighttime, it radiates heat. And you would notice this anytime you've driven in your car with the windows down or ridden your bike in the summertime, and you go past in, like an open field, and all of a sudden, you feel the temperature drop. That's the heat island effect. And it's really cool if you're farming because for us in Kelowna here, it, as far as downtown is concerned, this equates to about 45 more di frost-free days for a growing season. So that's pretty huge for farming. The other great thing about being in the city is that I'm so close to my markets that the point of harvest to the point of sale is sometimes literally blocks away. So that's a challenge for a lot of rural farmers these days is how do you market your product if you don't have connections to those markets? Well, this is basically an advertisement in the city that says, we're farming right here, and this food's available. So we've never had a problem selling our product because people walk by this garden all the time, and they go, what is this? What a, what a fantastic idea. And the cool thing about it is, as far as connecting people to agriculture again, is they see that, and whether they would have been along the same lines politically as myself or maybe some of you here, they see that and go, what a great idea. Why wouldn't I buy vegetables from somebody who's growing them right next door to me? Another thing I should mention, too, is that you might, you might be wondering how we get our land. How does, this, how does this happen? Well, when we started, we just started developing one or two sites. And then people just started to, by seeing our work and what we've done, they started just calling us. And now we've got a waiting list that's as tall as I am and combined land mass of over 100 acres because people really want to see this. 
And so basically people donate their land to our farm, and in return for us doing all the work, taking that lawn off of their hands, because a lawn is essentially a cost center. You know, you've got this green grass, you mow it, you water it, you put work into it, but there's no return. So that's most of our landowner's incentive is just, just take this off my hands. I don't want to deal with this anymore. But they also get a share of the crop. And they get a basket of vegetables each week from the whole farm, not just what's growing in their plot. So we specialize each of these plots to some sort of production. And this, and this picture, for example, is showing what our most intensive garden sites look like. And this is basically the, in our downtown core, about two different plots. And a site like this, this is 2,200 square feet, will produce 2,500 pounds of produce throughout the season through intensive relay planting where we're constantly turning over soil and adding organic material to that soil. This is another plot about eight blocks away, and it's a sort of a semi-intensive site. We don't grow uh, the intensive crops that we have on the first one that I showed you. This is more like patty pan squash and cucumbers and maybe beets, things that have a little bit longer of a date to maturity than quick growing salad greens. A site like this as well, 3,000 square feet, can produce close to that amount. Not quite as intensive, but the great thing about this kind of production, and there, there, are more, there are other forms of urban agriculture that are a lot more productive, but they're also a lot more cost intensive. This type of farming, I can get a site like that into production on less than $100 in material cost to get it going and less than six hours of labor. Really all that's involved is going in with a rototiller and rototilling in the grass. So I'm using the, the, the organic material that's there, and uh, I'm not worried about contamination, though we do test our soils, but you know, we're not in the urban, the dense urban uh, settings which you might have in some other big cities, and then that's a whole other different form of agriculture, form of urban agriculture, I should say. This type of urban farming can happen all over, because there's a lot of lawns in North America. This site here is the furthest in our network, and it's it, the furthest for a couple reasons. The one is that it's relatively big, so we can grow crops that generally have a lower uh, value per um, dollar per square foot, and they take longer to grow, but they also are the types of crops that suffer very little spoilage in their transport. So things like potatoes, onions, winter squash, small grains, these things can be transported, and they don't, they don't spoil right away. Whereas salad greens, if you, if you have to transport them a long distance from being cut in the field, they have to be refrigerated right, right away because they can suffer their, their spoilage. So if you really think about, this is an overview of our, of our garden network, if you really think about the way our farm is laid out, on how we could potentially plan our cities for better food production. We're not going to get rid of the globalized food system right away, but we can improve on it and take some of the pressure on it by looking at what we can grow locally and focusing on that. It doesn't make sense for us to get salad greens from California shipped here. For one, they spoil. If you buy spring mix from the grocery store, it usually lasts about three days. We can grow salad greens in British Columbia year round. With a little bit of season extension, it's no problem. But it might make more sense to, to, to have the grains and things that are longer types uh, season crops that can store well shipped in. So it's just about logistically planning that. And that's what our, how our farm is really laid out on a microcosm. So you can see we've got the potential for a pretty sustainable system here as far as, as, far as agriculture goes. I'll just show you a little bit more about it. I know I'm probably going on too long, but um, this is how we do everything on our farm. It's all done by bikes and trailers. And Kelowna is relatively flat, so it's probably more doable in, in this city than it is others. But this was sort of my ambition when I, when I saw my friend in Nelson doing this by his bike. I was like, how could I do this any other way? So we have custom-built steel frame trailers, and we do everything on the farm by bike. We have no gas-powered vehicles except our rototiller, and that's not really a vehicle. Last year, we produced 13,000 pounds of food on less than 100 liters of gasoline. This year, and that's, that gasoline is just used to run our rototiller, this year it's going to be about 25,000 pounds of food on about the same amount of fuel inputs. So we do everything on the farm by our bikes, whether it's delivering to restaurants in which we go to a restaurant and bring produce, but then we take their vegetable scraps at the same time, and that becomes our future soil amendments as we do composting on our, on our main facility here. We, we haul our rototiller from site to site and use that when we have to. So everything is done by our bikes. So I think I, I've shown you a little bit that we have the potential, if we're, not willing to do, if we're willing to do a little hard work, we've got the potential to have a very sustainable uh, food system right in our cities. 
where we can turn the local waste streams into the local fertility streams through composting. And we can perpetually build topsoil, increase our yields, and green our neighborhoods. We can cut out most of the food miles because most of the food we need can be grown close to where we are. And the nice thing about this is this connects people to the natural rhythms of the season and forces us to live within nature's limits. Just imagine what our cities would look like if we had an urban farmer on every street corner producing healthy, abundant, fresh food for the people in that community. I believe we need 50 million farmers right now to decentralize and democratize the food system. A decentralized food system will prove much more resilient as we head into times of economic uncertainty and unpredictable weather patterns as a result of climate change. And as a worldwide effort, this can create millions of permanent jobs. And these are jobs with purpose, because you can actually feel good about the things you're producing for your community. And that's the thing that I really love about farming, is everything I do and put out is helping better the health and the awareness of the people around me. And that's the best kind of economics, true intrinsic economics, where the things you produce have a value to everyone. And I think local agriculture has the potential and should be the backbone of our economy, and it has been in the past. And if it is that way, then GDP and this whole perpetual-based growth economic system totally becomes irrelevant. If you're identifying, with, um, uh, identifying what I'm showing you here, then turning something like this, a relatively derelict site, lawn, not really doing anybody any good, into something like this, isn't actually that much hard work if you're willing to do a little bit of hard work. And I think, personally, most people could benefit from a little bit of hard work. <laughs> the great thing about farming this way is that you don't need to have a lot of money to start up, and you don't even need to own your own land. In fact, it's better to not own your land, because then you're not locked into debt, and you're not tied into a particular place. The best part about this is that you can do this today, you can start today, it can be in your backyard, or it can be in somebody else's. Thanks a lot.